Welcome back to another Somerville Media Center, Somerville Journal News Roundup. Uh, once again, I'm happy to be joined with uh, by Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. Welcome, Julia. Good morning. Thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. Um, there is a lot to go over. Um, it's been uh, two weeks since our last roundup, and it's been an, a, a very intense two weeks, um, kind of globally, all the way down to uh, locally. Um, and that, of course, we're talking about the um, the Black Lives Matter uh, protests and vigils that have occurred um, in the recent weeks, um, including here in Somerville, most recently on, on Sunday in East Somerville. Um, so Julia, why don't you give us an update on, on some of these goings on? Sure. Um, so as you said, there is really a lot to unpack with this. Um, so forgive me if I bop around a bit. <laughs> Um, but yes, um, to kind of start with the kind of actions that have happened in the city, um, there have been a couple demonstrations. Um, on Thursday, June 4th, there was a protest in Davis Square um, that filled a, a pretty good part of the square. Um, if, if you're familiar with Davis, there's kind of like a turn from Holland onto Elm and that whole thing was closed down with barricades. Uh, people were kind of on every different like island um, holding posters and um it was a pretty sizable demonstration. Um, there was a heavy police presence at that demonstration, um, but it was it was peaceful and it really it was mostly kind of people standing in the middle of the square and chanting. Um, and then at one point they kind of took off around the block and walked around the block and went back. Um, but that was kind of the first major demonstration that I knew of that was Somerville organized and based. Um, and then on Saturday there was a protest that started in Porter Square that kind of went through Somerville down Beacon. Um, which wasn't necessarily Somerville led and organized, but was kind of in and around the city. Um, and then on Sunday, that's the one that's really notable. Um, a new organization in Somerville called Just Us Somerville, literally just formed, um, is a kind of group um, that is meant to kind of um, organize and uplift voices of residents of color in Somerville. Um, and they, um, in coalition with um, some other community partners, such as um, the Welcome Project um, school committee member Andrea Green, a Ford Four counselor at large, Will and Ba, who are both men of color, um, they put on this rally and candlelight vigil right outside of the East Somerville uh, Public Library branch um, on Broadway. We're gathered in peace to make sure that you understand that the murder of George Floyd, the murder of Breonna Taylor, and the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey were collectively the last straw the straw that broke our backs. Our backs, those of black Americans, have been breaking on the soil of what we now call the United States for over 400 years. But on May 25th, 2020, as a white police officer dug his knee into the neck of George Floyd for eight minutes, 46 seconds, a shot was heard around the world. It's not easy being black in this day and age. And as a black man with a black wife and two black kids and a black public official, it's pretty certain that I can't help but think about the violence and the brutality that I saw. I'm not gonna thank the organizers. I'm not gonna thank you guys. Because frankly, I don't wanna be here tonight. I'm tired. We've done this cycle too many times. Black people are executed for the crime of being black. We express our outrage. You express your, you pledge unity. We all become more vocal about equity. If we're very, very lucky, we might make some positive change happen. Then the next news story hits, and a few months later, we do it all over again. So, we all saw this man being killed by this police officer in cold blood. So as we continue to think about the time it took for this officer to kill this man, let's also think about the individuals that stood around and watched for eight minutes and 46 seconds. How did they feel? What was their fear? The political system, their fear to just stop one of them? As we all stand around, do you think you could watch someone be killed? It happened. Today, 
we don't have to stand and watch that anymore. Right. Amen. Um, and I was not physically present. They Facebook lived it. It is up on their Facebook page. You can go and find them on Facebook and watch the whole thing. It was um, one hum of person to person's opinion, pretty quite, uh, quite beautiful, I think. Um, it was a peaceful protest. Um, it was a large protest. You can kind of see everyone spilling out like across the street and um, into the kind of neighboring blocks. Um, and there were representatives of Justa Somerville who spoke, um, Councillor Mbaugh spoke, couldn't remember, Green spoke. Um, there's a 19 year old um, woman and organizer, Kenya Arbaiza, who um, recently graduated from Real High School, who spoke. Uh, to stop co-opting black and brown narratives. Allyship is to stand with communities of color to work on issues together. We have a voice. You better stop using your voice to talk over us. This current demand to end racial justice needs to be centered around communities of color. Talk to your local community before deciding how to act. Stop deciding what's best for us. Secondly, we demand a civilian review committee that looks at policies and has mostly people impacted by the police. Policies that allow the use of force need to be examined on top of policies that create potential interactions with my communities and the police officers. She shared something which kind of brings me to the next thing I want to talk about, which is what kind of what Somerville is doing. So. Um, to kind of give a little context, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact day, but in the first week of June, I'm kind of in the midst of all of this, um, the city and the mayor um, declared a public health state of emergency for racism in Somerville. Um, and this is, this is an action that people have supported and uplifted in terms of finally recognizing the urgency of the moment. Um, there are um, certainly, you know, a diverse kind of array of opinions on whether it's enough. Um, but, you know, he didn't announce it alone. He didn't say there's a safe emergency and then nothing else. He announced kind of a, a number of actions that he intends to take and that he is going to start working on with the city council and et cetera. Um, but I think it's really important um, in this moment to, you know, to first of all, kind of familiarize yourself with what he is committing to. Um, but to also going back to the rally that was held on Sunday, to listen to what the communities of color are saying. Because at that rally, Kenya Arbeza read out a list of demands, action items, kind of just plans that Just Us Somerville wants to see happen in Somerville. And while there is some overlap, it is not the same list. Um, so I, I think, you know, and this has all happened very recently, and I'm not sure, you know, the city hasn't responded exactly and specifically to each of these demands that were listed. And I actually um, recently spoke with a member of Justice Somerville and she described um, their organization as very much kind of still, still learning and still being created. And she said that this list is not by any means an exhaustive list. Um, she said that they're kind of still learning how to fly the plane. It really is like very newly formed organization. Um, so I think, you know, we should all kind of look to those demands, which are also posted in their Facebook group, um, as just the beginning, you know what I mean, of what they want to see happen in the city. Um, but to kind of start getting into it, um, you know, the, the, the kind of, uh, list of action items that the mayor, um, released, um, he said that he based them on Ayanna Prosley's, um, plan, who is our Somerville's representative, um, in Congress. Um, there's a number of them. It was a very long press release. <laughs> Um, yeah. so, you know, it's, it's a lot to unpack. I'm not going to try to do all of that right now. Um, but to just, you know, at the surface level, there's elements of civilian oversight, um, which is something that is, was also demanded by Justice Somerville. Um, there are, I think, some differing opinions on how to develop this. Um, the city kind of recommended hiring an outside, um, I'm not recalling the word, but some like an outside person to kind of come in and figure out how to do this. And I think some of the community members are saying that's not necessary. We have the resources we need. The experts are already here in our community. You just need to listen to them. Mm -hmm. um, so, but there, there definitely is urgent in conversations around like what police oversight is going to look like. Yeah. Um, there's also a resolution being submitted by counselors in Ba, um, JT Scott and Lance Davis at the Thursday city council meeting on June 11th. Um, 
that addresses that as well. That is in itself its own kind of comprehensive um, action plan on how to go about this, um, which was developed in coalition with POC led organizations. Um, so there's a lot happening around that point. Um, yeah, I, I was at the the rally on Sunday, mm-hmm. and that was definitely a theme uh, when when Andre Green spoke. Uh, that a lot of these sorts of policies are usually uh, made for communities of color, for black people, and not with them. Um, and that was part of the the frustration that he, uh, the ongoing frustration that he addressed in his speech. So, um, absolutely. You know, in light of of the mayor's um, statement of emergency, declaring race racism um, uh, a public health emergency, you know, we will see how how that um, how that develops um, in light of all these concerns. Um, and and just to circle back on the the candlelight vigil on Sunday, um, yeah, there was not a heavy police presence at the the vigil itself. Um, certainly there were, there were, uh, patrols that were circling the area before and after. Um, but I think that there was a conscious effort by the city to, to not have a, a show of, of police there. Um, mm. and, uh, there was a section of Broadway right in front of the library branch that was closed off. And, uh, I think the organizers had more people, uh, uh attend than they had anticipated because they did mark off social distancing markers. Uh, on the sidewalk, um, but there was uh, a lot of spillover into uh, onto Broadway itself. Um, and uh, I, I will agree with you. Yeah, it was very emotionally uh, packed. It was a, it was an emotionally uh, packed uh, event. Um, and I I was there filming on behalf of Somerville Media Center. And then you you as in addition to seeing it on the Justice um, Somerville website Facebook page, excuse me, uh, you can see it uh, on SomervilleMedia.org. Um, and on some of the community access television. Um, so, yeah, so we touched on, on the, the vigils and the protests, the events leading up to that, uh, the mayor's declaration. And there's also this, this petition to defund police. Um, and that's, that's something that's occurring in cities everywhere. People are looking at city budgets and uh, noticing that the police, is, uh, the police departments are the biggest chunk of them. Um, so what is happening locally uh, with that? Absolutely. Um, so the petition started, um, I think about a week and a half ago, um, a group of residents uh, kind of wrote this petition and started circulating it. And the response was pretty immediate. Um, I remember, I you know I heard about it when it kind of had just been posted and within hours it had like 300 signatures within 24 hours, it had a thousand signatures and, and now it's, it's over 3000 signatures. Um, so it's, it's really, um, it's grown. A lot of community members are signing on to this petition. Um, I believe it is, it is, has been, or is shortly being delivered officially to the city, um, you know, to, to get a response. Um, but it's, it's something that's really important to think about because it is June and June is the end of the fiscal month. <laughs> um, so our, our city and, our neighboring cities are in the throes of municipal budget processes. Um, so it is painfully relevant um, to, to where we are in this moment of local governance um, that a, a large number of Somerville residents are asking for a big change in how we have been funding our police department. And the other kind of important aspect of this is that we are, because we're still in a pandemic, <laughs> don't you know, remember that, yeah. um, that you know we are all in most local governments state governments really everyone is is just struggling with an extreme lack of revenue and you know trying to navigate you know trying to level service budgets and what can we cut and what can we keep and what are we going to have to sacrifice and you know a lot of i think hard conversations are happening around um budgeting in in cities um and and states i'm sure um so now you know now that there is this movement to defund the police there's also an urgency for like taking that funding and putting it somewhere else. Like we, we have other places and programs and services that need funding because they're not going to be financed by the revenues that we projected we would have. So like now's the time is kind of the, the energy that's happening around that. Um, but it's, it's a complicated issue um, because I think, you know, when you really um, do the reading and, and look to organizations who've been organizing around defunding and kind of to use their language, abolishing the police, um, 
it's not, it's not a one and done process. It's not really a quick process. It's yeah. a steady kind of um, sustained reallocation of resources away from the police department. And while our city council and administration may be able to begin taking action on that since we're in budget season, it's not, it's not going to happen immediately. And it also, I, I think it may be a little foolish to assume that it will, because it's a complicated process that we're going to need to start kind of um, lifting up and enriching other parts of our city government so they can start taking over responsibilities in terms of mental health recovery, substance abuse prevention. Like there are other things that we have established, which just need kind of more funding and more staffing to kind of take on some of that responsibility. Mm. But I am not an expert. This is things I have learned from looking to organizations who are doing this work. Um, So, I think that it's going to be a really tense, urgent couple of weeks mm. um, because, you know, for good reason, um, the city is, you know, I think having trouble um, coming up with a budget and they're not going to be delivering a budget to the city council as soon as they usually do. So a typical budget process would be that, you know, at the beginning of the month, the beginning of June, which we have already passed, um, the administration delivers a budget to the city council and they take about a month of of almost exclusively finance committee meetings to review that budget, to have hearings with each department head, to hear from the departments to kind of justify why they need that funding. Um, And then the city council makes cuts. Um, The city council is only authorized to make cuts. They cannot reallocate resources themselves. Um, So that is their power in the budgeting process. And then they are tasked with approving the budget so that it can go into effect. Mm. Um, But according to the the chair of um, the finance committee meeting, JT Scott, um, and he has said that the administration will not be getting them a budget to review before June 18th, uh, which is next week. Um, And that, it's pretty unusual. We're in an unusual situation. Situation, but the part that's a little bit tough is that the city is proposing an annual budget, which means that in order for anything, any funding to happen in July, which is just a few weeks away, the city council needs to review and approve an annual budget, which is probably the most controversial budget, local municipal budget in history, or at the very least recent history. Um, and I think that some counselors and constituents are a little alarmed about that mm. um, because this is a, it's, I mean, defunding the police is, it's a, it's an important piece, but it's really, it's one piece of right. what's going to be a really difficult budget to review because of all of the changes in revenue. So, and, and to be clear, nobody's talking about defunding the police in Somerville or, or are they, I mean, I'm on the, on the city council, on, on the decision makers end, they're not talking, you know, def- a wholesale defunding of the police. No, I, yes, thank you. That is an important clarification. So yes, I think, you know, as we're looking to what's happening around the country, for example, in Minneapolis, the city council has taken pretty severe, urgent action in terms of like defunding and like recreating. And we're kind of looking right now at what they're doing. Um, it's going to be kind of a model, I think, if they succeed in kind of what other counts, um, what other counselors can do across the country. So yes, thank you. It is not an immediate funding in terms of my understanding, but I think that this budget process is going to be kind of laced with this conversation right. around like, okay, like maybe we shouldn't raise the budget. You know what I mean? Maybe they can, you know, take, we can take away other things. Maybe they don't need a budget for military weapons. That was one of the points that the, um, uh, that the mayor brought up in his kind of commitment is to demilitarize the police. So to really look at the budget with a fine tooth comb and say, okay, we're not kind of immediately defunding and disbanding and trying to recreate the police. That's not necessarily what's going to happen in the next few weeks. Mm-hmm. But I think that the counselors are going to be looking at this because the constituents are asking for it with a really like a really fine tooth comb in terms of what, what can we reallocate? You know what I mean? Can we safely reallocate in this moment right. um, to continue having these conversations? Um, I think I think we might have a lot of viewers who uh, for whom the the concept of defunding the police is new because mm. you know and so they they might be asking like what are you talking about defunding the police you know you'll have anarchy if you defund the police yes um, so my you know my understanding is you know taking it's for cities to to take a a look at where the money is being allocated to within police departments you know, and rethinking, 
rethinking this system of law enforcement, local law enforcement that is in place all over the country because it's, it's, it's flawed severely um, and it's leading to violence against black people. Mm -hmm. Police departments uh, and police um, are, across the country are killing black people um, and the system is allowing for that. So it, it, the uh, the concept, as I understand it, of defunding police, um, and please weigh in on this, um, is taking an eye to these systems to see, you know, does it, do we need a wholesale rewrite in some instances and in other instances, um, you know, what, what can we change? What, where can we uh, take these funds and reallocate them um, better? Absolutely. So, so yes, first I want to say again that I'm not an expert and I'm a student in this moment looking to organizations like MPD 150, Reclaim the Block, and others, um, because I am, I am learning this on the ground, just like many other people. Um, so absolutely, I definitely kind of affirm that um, explanation. And I think, um, you know, what I've been hearing is that um, some people, you know, from a marketing perspective, say, the words defund and abolish are, are pretty general and blanket and can be easily misunderstood. Um, I, I understand why they're being used because, for example, we have been defunding education and mental health support and a lot of other things for a long time in the name of tax cuts and other things. So I understand why the language is being used. And I think that it is an important part of this. Um, but I think that that's something to consider. And really what, what these organizations who are doing this work are saying is, look, for years we have been defunding other mechanisms of support for our citizens and then placing the burden of that on police departments which were never meant never built to manage this level of service and they shouldn't be because it, they're obviously it's not working you know what i mean even because you know even well-intentioned officers were not often trained to manage these kinds of crises so I think a lot of this is, you know, exactly what you said, like figuring out how to take those resources and kind of redirect them, but really looking strategically and saying, all right, why do we have these arrests? Who is being arrested? Who is being brutalized? Where can we stop that? Looking at things like the school to prison pipeline, literacy, you know what I mean? Like education, really investing in education, having more counselors in our schools, you know, having more support for our students, having you know, more prevention efforts within office with social workers and, you know, people who have just have degrees in managing these things, you know what I mean? Not just in law enforcement, but in hum human behavior. Um, so I think that it's kind of looking to redesign how these crises are managed in our city and then put those resources behind them. And that's the reallocation piece, I think. That's the defunding piece is to take, to take that money to say, okay, police department, you are no longer responsible for this. You know what I mean? This is going over here. Um, and there are many, many levels of that. There are conversations around traffic enforcement because a lot of violations of black and brown rights have happened in traffic enforcement um, and like why we have to have armed officers doing traffic stops. Um, so there, there are a lot of different conversations. I am not educated enough to talk about all of them, but please, I mean, there are tons and tons of resources out there about like the levels of this conversation. The MPD 150, I've, I've said them a couple of times, they have an amazing zine, um, which you can find on their website, which is a great starting point for kind of what this conversation is about. Mm. Um, and I'm sure if you, if you look all over their website, you will find much more information. Um, they are a Minneapolis-based Minneapolis -based organization, um, and they're doing really great work. Um, but it's just, so yes, so I, I think, you know, getting back to the budget, there are going to be some tough conversations had. Um, I think, you know, it's important to keep this in mind, but also just, um, I think the city council, um, you know, and these budget talks are really haven't begun because they haven't received a budget. Um, yeah. But I think there's going to be some tension because some city councilors, are not have said that they don't want to approve an annual budget, that they're not going to approve an annual budget that is the most controversial budget in two weeks' time, that they won't do it. So they, but they don't have the power to simply approve one twelfth of it. The administration has to come before them with a one twelfth budget for them to approve. Um, so you know, if there, if there was ever a time to kind of pay attention to to city council meetings, it's right now. Mm -hmm. 
um, because I think it's going to be a a tough couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And we urge, uh, we urge any, anybody who, who has concerns about, uh, the events of the the last few weeks and, uh, or are just, you know, interested in seeing where, where the money is supposed to, uh, be allocated in the next year. Yes. Uh, pay attention. (laughs) Um, so moving on to, uh, our, our last, uh, segment here, uh, uh, there, there was a resident who reached out to you about what they were doing for um, hardworking market basket employees. Um, yeah. so loop us in on that. Yes, this is just something lovely. I try to remember that there is loveliness. <laughs> um, and this this resident, Nico Lang, reached out to me a couple of weeks ago. Um, just being a resident of the Union Square area and just wanting to appreciate her local market basket workers and said, hey, like, you know, these workers are so amazing. They're on the front lines for us. I started a GoFundMe. We raised a couple hundred dollars, but I would really love if you could write about it so that we could just like raise a little more money. I would just want to buy them a couple lunches. You know what I mean? And um, I spoke with her. She's absolutely lovely. Um, And, you know, was just speaking so highly of um, these workers and just sharing so much deep appreciation for the fact that you know, they're out there for all of us right now. Um, and just expressed really wanting to show them that like the community sees them and sees their work and sees, you know, that they're going to work for us and that without them, we wouldn't have food and resources. Um, so she, you know, just spoke to me and I, I shared an article about a week ago and she's since raised over $2,000. Um, and if you, if you look, um, you're more than welcome to donate. Um, she has a couple plans. She wants to work with um, local businesses. So she said, I want to reinvest all this money back into the Union Square community. She wants to get like Himalayan Kitchen and some other local businesses to cater lunches for the Market Basket employees. And then she said she wants to open a tab at like the Fortissimo Cafe right across the street and um, just to have them able to like go and get a coffee before work. And um, it, so it's really, you know, it's an ongoing thing. She met her goal. She was just trying to raise $500. Um, but she's she's so excited, and she said, um, if you look in the GoFundMe page, which you can find in the article, um, I think she she posted a little update and said, you know, she she told the market basket manager, and he was like, oh, that's so exciting, maybe we can get a couple pizzas, and she was like, well, like we've raised over two thousand dollars, I think we can do better than pizza, uh-huh. um, and it was just really sweet. Um, so I think you know, it's just a reminder that um, you know, there's a lot of amazing community work going on small and large, you know, this, this community advocacy around, you know, police is really important and a really incredible thing that's happening. And so is this one resident who is trying to raise money for lunches for market basket employees. So um, I think it just made me happy. It made me feel like, you know, we can make a little difference here and there. Um, So I just wanted to share that with, with you. That's a, that's a great way to, uh, to end this, this roundup. Um, and uh, yeah, I appreciate I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me and to to highlight these stories, which can be found on the Somerville Journal's website. Sure can, somerville.wickedlocal.com. <laughs> so I encourage everybody to uh, go check that out. Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. Always a pleasure to speak with you. You too, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, and um, everybody, be be safe out there. Be kind. <laughs>